Good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. What a pleasure it is to welcome David Baldacci and Jake Tapper together. This is an encore event because we actually tried this in May, but but it didn't quite work out. So this is exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. So Jake Tamper's new book is called The Devil May Dance. It is, in fact, our June historical fiction book of the month. Uh, Patrick's holding up. We still have autographed copies. So thank you, Jake, for signing those for us. It's terrific. We, we've almost sold them all out. I think we only have maybe a dozen left. So um, anyway, it's a wonderful book. David will be talking about it. David's most recent book that was out in May is The Gambling Man, and I'm going to get this wrong, Aloysius Archer, Aloysius Archer? Aloysius, you got it. Aloysius Archer, my, my, my Irish is not as good as it could be. And David is going to have a new book out in November called Mercy with Atlee Pine, and David very kindly autographs books for us on request, and so we'll have autographed copies to offer you then. Anyway, um, that's all we need to say. Patrick uh, is going to be monitoring the Facebook feed. If you have questions, you can type them in and David will summon him back and he can forward them. And Patrick, are you gonna put in links to the two books? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and put in links uh, to both books in the comments field. So, and if you have questions for either author, just type them in and I'll be happy to, to ask them. Wonderful. All right, so with that, David, please take over. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Jake, I, I apologize for what happened last time. I obviously did not pay my online bill, so they, they wouldn't let me back on um, the last time we tried to get together, but um, I'm so glad we got to do this again. You know, the, the Devil May Dance is just a terrific book, and I have a lot of things I wanted to talk to you about. When I'm sitting down to, to write a novel, um, the first chapter is so critical uh, for me, and I labor over it and over it and over it to get it exactly right. The first chapter in your novel is dynamite. Um, I don't want to give anything away. It, 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 it ends with an absolute just corker of a twist. Um, but talk, talk about how you sort of conceived that first chapter. Did you always know it was going to open that way? Did you have another idea and changed it? Or was this, this the way it was always going to open? Thank you so much, David. First of all, let me just uh, thank Poison Pen and thank you um, for doing this. Um, for those who don't know, this is an encore event because uh, we couldn't get um, the connection right uh, for David's uh, Wi-Fi, his Zoom, whatever it is. And I have to say, since that happened, um, I have a, a, a country house in, in Virginia, and I did an event for Politics and Pros, and I had the same problem. And I think, I don't want to sound like a commercial for the infrastructure bill, but it is very clear that there are a lot of pockets in this country where the infrastructure for broadband is not what it needs to be uh, as illustrated. And I can't imagine if two, you know, pampered babies like you and me can't get the broadband we need, what it's like for, you know, people in Appalachia or the inner city or the like. So um, anyway, I, this is what happened. So I wrote the first book in the series, The Hellfire Club, and... That, that opens with the main character, Charlie Martyr, waking up after a car accident in Rock Creek Park in Washington, D.C. And what had happened is a friend of mine reading the book, uh, reading an early draft where it wasn't even done, but like a bunch of chapters and then an outline, said, you should start with chapter eight or whatever, and then back into it. Um, because that, that is just such a great scene. He wakes up, he doesn't know where he is. And before the first chapter had been what ended up being the second chapter, which is Charlie and Margaret at this uh, event at the theater in Washington. And here are all these famous um, politicians from the 1950s. And I thought, wow, what, that's, a, that's a really great idea. And then I, so I just did it again. I mean, that's all it was. I just took like the moment where the main character like is in trouble, which is you know, in the classic three arc structure, chase your character up a tree, throw rocks at your character, get your character out of the tree. Like this is where he's in trouble, usually at the at the like major trouble at the at the at one third into the book. Holy crap, what am I gonna do? Just start the book with that. And then back into it, that adds a different level of intrigue and then proceed from there. And uh, so yeah, I just did it again. And then when writing this book, um, and you learn something new every time you write, or at least I do, 
Um, I don't know if there's anything left for you to learn, David, but, but, but um, for me, uh, one of the things I thought is, why don't I just put every scene in like the wildest, most compelling place I can put it instead of, um, you know, where most of life happens in a living room, in a kitchen, in an office. So you start off, I, it, you're, you're in Forest Lawn Cemetery in the middle of the night, looking at the graves of famous people with the Rat Pack, and they're all drunk, and one of, and, and one of them has a gun. And they're just, you know, and it's just like, and I just thought, I'm just going to do every scene as much as possible like that. As me, you know, so I put things on movie sets, and you know, at Sinatra's estate in uh, near Palm Springs, and at the Oscars, and here and there, just because I just thought, I, you know, this isn't, um, you know, between the world and me, this isn't like a compelling, uh, you know, Tanahasi Coates's letter about racism to his son. This isn't that. This is a fun novel where people are just like, just have fun, just enjoy yourself. I'm having fun writing it. You should have fun reading it. Please enjoy. It. And so that's that's what the thought was. You know, people, when I go out and do book signings and other events, people ask me, how come your, you know, your, your books always open with a bang? And I said, because I'm competing against TikTok. <laughs> and uh, people, even people, you know, who read a number of books, their attention spans over the last 10 years, five years have just compressed. I mean, it just really, you have to hit the ground running. There's not a lot of warm up anymore. I, you know, I love, I love works from a long time ago with this sort of had this slow build up and they're beautiful pieces. Um, I'm not sure they would appeal to as many people today, just not because they're not really great stuff. It's just people just don't have the patience anymore to sort of sit there and languidly turn the pages and be impressed with the prose and all that. Um, you know. no, I totally agree. And in fact, so my son is 11 and he really wants to watch he, he's he, he just got he's been into interested in the Vietnam War, and then he st just started asking me, "Are there any war movies that we can watch together?" And most of the really good war movies are just way too graphic and terrifying for an eleven-year-old. But then I just um, I just came across the idea of, uh, last night when I was just stumbling around uh, on uh, on the TV, like, "Well, I'll just watch all these like." 1940s 50s movies with him you know where eagles fly and and you know this bridge over the river Kwai because they're all pg-13 uh because they're not that graphic but they're really good they're really good but i'm worried that because my son is a you know he watches youtube and tiktok we'll see if he has the patience he got through moonrise kingdom the other night so maybe he will I had my my son. He's he's 25 now, and a few years ago, um, I said, "Hey, because uh, I've been sort of writing these period books with Archer in the 40s. One of my favorite films is The Big Sleep. Um, so I said, let's watch The Big Sleep together. And I've I've had a hard time getting them and my wife to watch Chinatown. She goes, Chinatown? I don't get Chinatown. Look, I said, Chinatown. It's all about water. So, but forget that part. Just Focus on the, the dialogue, the characters, the clothes, the cars. That's really the compelling part of Chinatown. But the plot itself, it's just about water. So the big sleep. So we started watching the you know, first five minutes. And my son, and God bless him, and you know, he's a 21st century young man. He says, Dad, this is ridiculous. I can't believe this is so sexist. It's misogynistic. Humphrey Bogart is just, a, I, I can't watch this movie. And, and I said, you know, son, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> You're, it's just amazing. You know, your mother obviously did something right in raising you. Um, but if you could just maybe put that aside for a second <laughs> and just watch the film with me, he goes, no, no, I, I can't. So he just, he is he never watched the big sleep. So, but there you go. One of yeah. the things, one of the things about watching like an old movie like that, like the Maltese Falcon is, is um, it's, it was so groundbreaking for its day. It's been so imitated that it's almost, um cliche at this point you know, that's one of the that's one of the problems uh with it um but let me also put in a plug for archer because um i read uh one small favor and it's uh it's, it's the first in the archer series um Gamely man is the second which i haven't read yet i'm, I'm going to uh, it's so good, and it's it's set right after World War II in the nineteen in the late nineteen forties, as the build up to the fifties when everything just boomed and the United States became the world power it is today, and it's just so good at at uh, 
Um, I'm gonna, I know I'm going to botch the name of your invented Western town. It's, a, it's like Pika City or something like that. What is it? Yeah. Yeah. Spock City. City. So it's so it's um, but it's just so good at at uh, uh, at capturing that moment in in the country where like almost the, the bridge between the 18th century and the 19th century. Hmm. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, it's, if you can have those period pieces, you should invest some time in the atmosphere. Um, let's talk a little bit about research. Obviously, you did a, a ton of research for this novel. And for me, when I do research for my novels, the, the question always is, you know, there's this tug. You do all the work. It's fascinating stuff. You're really interested in it. You want to put a lot of it in. But at the end of the day, you have to leave most of it out. Um, right. Then it turns into a flip book, you know, where readers reading and they hit all the research you did and they flip, 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 flip past all the stuff. Right. Back to I used to do that with Tom Clancy book, Tom Clancy's books, and I, God rest his soul, really great writer, but he really loved the techno stuff and sometimes it was a little too much. So what, what's sort of your litmus test uh, of what to keep in and what to leave out and have sort of check your ego at the door and, you know, be really brutal? Um. Well, first of all, I have, um, in addition to a great editor, uh, uh, Judy Klain, and before that, uh, Reagan Arthur, um, I, I have friends of mine read it, like friends of mine who are writers or, or one of them is a showrunner in Hollywood and, and just like people who are able to say, you don't need this, you don't need that. The, the biggest criticism that the Hellfire Club got was that there was too much research um, before the plot gets going. And because I just found it, I loved it, right? And but that's the risk, right? Is that you fall in love with the the period, and you're so busy writing about what you've discovered that you kind of forget to tell the story to to bring people along, because because that's what that, that's what compels them to read it, not necessarily the, the environment. So I tried to correct that in the in the the Devil May Dance to the degree that. At one point, I'm reading between first draft and second draft. I, I have what I call first draft blues, which is when I'm convinced the thing is a piece of junk and no one's going to read it and it's horrible. And then I spend the, you know, the ensuing weeks and months figuring out how to fix it. And one of the things that I had to fix was I had a whole chapter. So a lot of the book takes place in the Palm Springs area, Rancho Mirage, because it's about... Um, Charlie and Margaret, my heroes, are investigating whether or not Sinatra is actually mobbed up because President Kennedy has been invited to stay with Sinatra, which is a true story. Sinatra was actually um, facing, uh, had, uh, Sinatra had actually invited him and there were concerns about whether or not it would be appropriate given that mobsters had slept at, at the, the estate. So anyway, Eisenhower is a big figure in the Hellfire Club. During research, I figured out that or I discovered that Eisenhower also moved to Palm Springs exactly around that time, 1961, 62. <clears throat> and I thought, wow, that's amazing. And I'll have a whole visit where Charlie uh, visits with President Eisenhower just down the street from Sinatra. And isn't that amazing coincidence? And I read all this stuff about how the Eisenhower Palm Springs um, a state was decorated, and I had this whole chapter about, I think his name was Robert Taylor. He was an actor who ended up becoming an advisor to Eisenhower during his presidency. Anyway, long story long, rereading it, I'm like, nothing happens in this chapter except for one line at the end of it. Charlie gets a phone call and finds out something that he needed to know, and I'm like, I hate to do it, but I just need to chuck this whole, this entire chapter and just take this one thing and stick it on the end of this character, uh, this chapter. And it's, I guess it was Faulkner that said, we referred to killing your darlings, but you just, you just have to, you just have to, you just have to be brutal about it. And I'm constantly, when I'm, when I'm showing it to people, I'm constantly saying, please pretend you're the Grim Reaper, Grim Reaper, and go in there with a scythe. Tell me what to cut. I want it to. I want it to be lean. Your books always feel very lean to me. I mean that in the best possible way. And there's no fat. It's just every you know. And and I, I I would like to emulate that. So I just know that that's a weakness of mine. And I and I try to correct for it. How do you do it? You know, I think over the years, um, I used to write screenplays. 
in place. You just have to be economical with it. Everything has two purposes. Otherwise, it's not going to be in there. Um, and you everybody looking over your shoulder and really uh, I've adapted one of my books to film and the question there is you have to cut most of the book out and keep the essential core. So, but, you know, over the years, I really have gotten a lot more. I, I was too wordy in my earlier books. I, I took 100 words to describe something I could have done in 10. And when I sit down to write every book now, I really am completely brutal with myself. Um, and I just, you know, what if, my, my litmus tests are sort of, if it doesn't advance the plot, if it doesn't develop a character further, if it doesn't give the reader information they need to know to follow the story, it's not gonna be in the book. And those are my, sort of my three litmus test pieces. And I find myself continually going back to those things and you know testing each sentence, each paragraph, each chapter. But even sometimes I, I still run afoul and I, I'd love to talk about the, your editorial process with your editor. I've, I've had the same person, Mitch Hoffman, for like over 20 books now he actually left the publisher, became an agent, um, but I did not want to change horses in the middle of the race of my age and my career. So the publisher still engages him to, to edit my books um, because we've established you know, a great relationship of trust. And, and in one novel, uh, recent novel, I had set up you know, laboriously this twist that was going to happen at the end. I set it up in the beginning of the novel. It was actually a gambling man. It was a really, really cool twist. And after the sort of the denouement of the actual plot in the book, this one came after. And Mitch said, you don't need that. It, you know, it makes the book weaker. And I was like, I took great pains to set this up. This is a, he goes, it's an absolute terrific twist. It just makes the book weaker. And, and we argued about it for a while. And finally, you know, towards the end when it's getting like to, okay, this is it, you know, I have to make the decision. He was right. You know, it made the book weaker. Can you talk about this? Yeah. yeah. And we just, and I cut it. Um, and I'm glad that I did because the more I thought about it and now looking back, it's an easy decision. I was so in the middle of this tunnel vision about I had done all this work and I set this thing up and it was going to be really cool and people are going to take that away as their last memory. But it was not the, it was not the memory of the actual plot of the story. And it would be like it, it would be like having a third arm. I just left an additional appendage dangling onto the end of this novel. And that was a reminder to me after 50 books that people's opinions, people you trust, they matter. And you need to listen to them and give them respect. And don't think that just because you've been doing this as long as I've been doing it, that I've got all the answers and other people have good ideas and their goals are the same. Everybody wants the book to be good as it possibly can be. Yeah, look, I mean, um, there's a scene in my book between my main character, Charlie and John Wayne. And that scene took place in real life, John Wayne and Frank Sinatra almost got into a fight at an event. And I had a scene like that in the book based on the real event. But then in the book, I don't want to spoil anything. It doesn't really spoil anything, but I, I, uh, I have Charlie kind of like interfere. And the reason is because, and this is, if this is also why it's good to have lots of people read it. Uh, is that my brother, who is a religious studies professor at, at the University of San Francisco and not a, he, he consumes a lot of, of, of books and, and entertainment, but he's not a, a fiction writer in any sense. But he read it and he was just like, I don't buy that Sinatra and the Rat Pack just accept Charlie in their gang. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Like, why would they do that? Why would Sinatra accept him in? And I was like, God damn, God damn that little that little kid. He's six six now, but whatever. God damn this guy. He's right. He is right. Aaron's right. My brother's right. It doesn't make any sense. So I had to give a reason for Sinatra to like Charlie, to appreciate Charlie. And I mean, what I always tell friends of mine when they're writing stuff, when they're writing books, nonfiction or fiction, really is. These are the criticisms, and you can either deal with them now, or you can read about them in the New York Times. Now is better. So, hmm. I, I I love that scene with Wayne. You know, John Wayne always had that uh, World War II problem, you know, yeah. where, and uh, I think it really gnawed at him. And um, but that was really, really cool. Scene. I really appreciate that. I, I found sometimes that when I give material and stuff to read, people will fixate on certain things like they just did there that never occurred to me, you know, like a core element. It's almost like you have this character, Charlie, you love, 
and you're like in the Rat Pack, cool, I'm just going to put him there, right. not think about why he sh would be there in real life, but another person is sort of looking in just a neutral tone and not have any sort of baggage behind them thinks, well, that's just a sort of a core question, <laughs> you know, why would Sinatra, you know, want that guy around? So that, you know, you're right, the more people sort of read it and give opinions, the better, and it's much better to do it on the front end rather than suffer through on the back end for this stuff. Can I, can I, can I tell you um, something about uh, one small favor that, um, that I love? And I, when I think of that book, I, I don't even know if you've been told this before. I don't want to, I'm, I'm tempted to say, what do you think I think of? But you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that because I, I think of Archer eating. You have this very compelling way of explaining where he goes, this one restaurant slash kind of cafeteria kind of place in town, in this place, where he gets like a, a steak and like all the bottomless coffee, black coffee, and he just wolfs it all down. And like, this is what I think of, what I, and I mean this again, in the highest, as a high, the highest possible compliment. But that's what I think of when I think of the book, because it's just so compelling. That is what this guy would be doing. He'd be so appreciative of a good meal. And he'd be so happy he had money in his pocket. And you tell about it very compellingly. I can almost taste the, the steak and the, and, and the uh, and drink and the coffee. Hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, I think in a, in a land of abundance, we, uh, you know, in 2021, I think we take it for granted that, you know, people even of modest means can have a lot of things in their life. You know, it wasn't that long ago, you know, the end of the 1940s into the 1950s where people only had a very few things to themselves and, um, and they really appreciated what they did have. My, my, my father grew up during the depression to the very, very, very tail end of it. And he was a little kid, but uh, he had lots of siblings. He was one of 10 um, and his whole life was sort of lived that way um, where he never took anything for granted. Uh, my wife, my, my mom grew up very hard scrabble in the mountains of Southwest Virginia. I, I remember telling her in, in 2004, the Washington Post did a, a story on where my mom grew up. Not because that's where she grew up. It's another, another facet of the story. It was on Ramsey's Ridge. And um, in 2004, they finally brought running water and electricity to Ramsey's Ridge in 2004. 2004. And she grew up there in the 30s and the 40s. It's just so it's just a different mentality. But if you're going to write a book like that, um, you know, you need to sort of put people in that time period in one way. Yeah. Or another. And I and I and the research could be overwhelming. And what I did, I asked myself a very simple question. I said, I could overwhelm myself on like how much I need to know to write for this period of 1949. So what I did was, I said, I'm going to wake Archer up one day of his life. I'm going to walk him through that entire day and I'm going to put him to bed at night and everything that happens to him, everything he has to do during the course of that one day will tell me pretty much everything I need to know research wise about to, to have somebody living in 1949, how they eat, how they dress, what they smoke, where they go, how they drive, all that stuff. And that made it a lot more manageable for me, um, which leads to my, my next question is obviously you have an incredible career uh, as a journalist. Um, you have a show on television. You have this whole second career. I know you've probably been asked this a lot, but I'm really curious. When I, my first book, I was a trial lawyer in DC. No matter what you may think of lawyers, you may hate them, but they work really long hours because all yeah. we have is to sell are little bits of our soul. So how do you juggle it all? I mean, how do you make time? Where, where do you write when you get a chance to write? Do you have a, do you have a keep to a schedule? Is this kind of like any which way you can? It's any which way I can. I mean, the first thing that I do is think about the book and like usually you know because the, the first book was in the 50s the second was in the 60s um i was going to do the third in the 80s but I, I was convinced to do it in the 70s just as like you know the next thing um the next decade and then i think about okay what's going on in that decade that i want to have as part of the plot so for instance i have to think about charlie will have been through Watergate. Republican congressman from New York will have been through Watergate. Um, so where is Charlie in 1977? Because I want it to be like kind of like a new era. Jimmy Carter is taking office. It's disco, it's, you know, Studio 54, kind of like an exciting time in the 70s, as, as it were, as opposed to like 79 when the country's in the doldrums. And so, I, you know, I'm just thinking about like the trends so a lot of it's just like kind of like rumination, 
then I read about that era a lot. I go through magazines, I go through world books, I read newspapers. Then I do an outline. And so when I get to the outline part of it, and I'm, writing, I'm talking about this like I've written like 300 books like you have, when I've only written uh, two, but um, two non, two fiction anyway. But one of the things I do is, um, I'm, first of all, I find outlining very important for me because it gives me a task to do. Today I'm going to read, I'm going to do this part of the outline. And then also, um, I just, once I'm in a writing project, I commit to myself to always writing at least 15 minutes a day, always. Because anyone, no matter how busy their day, can spend 15 minutes in meals or at the end of the day or the beginning of the day or coffee or what happens. You can always find 15 minutes. If that's all you do in a week, that's an hour 45, that's four pages, it's something three or four pages. Even if it's garbage, you've written some stuff that you then can throw out. You've solved the problem in your head about something that doesn't work. And I carry around a laptop with me, a MacBook, all the time. I write in Google Docs um, so that wherever I am, I have access to it. Um, and just wherever I am, I have it. Wait in line at the doctor's office, you know, waiting in the waiting room at the doctor's office, here's, here's 10 minutes. Um, boring meeting, here's, here's half an hour, you know, especially if it's via Zoom. So that's what I do. And it's worked so far. Um, so the publisher wants me to write another, and I have to start thinking about that. And theoretically, it would be, I guess, 2023 it would come out. So I need to get cracking. But um, that's the process. What about you? Yeah, I um, I don't do a, a major outline. I definitely, you know, have a conception of what the, I want the story to be, and then I research and write as I go along. And I do sort of miniature outlines along the way, maybe chapter by chapter to make sure all the points I need to hit in that space, um, I do. Um, I like to, for me, writing in the moment is so critical because you're totally immersed in the story and, you, and your mind is going a million miles an hour. And you see the field, like a running back sees the field, every other defender on it. And you see every possibility that I found that for outlines for me don't inspire that level of depth in my thinking. But if I'm in the moment, I'm running down the alley, somebody's shooting at me, you know, the mind is, is just moving at hyper speed and lots of things develop in front of me for that. And I can always go back and make sure it all hangs together and checks together. Sometimes I, I just, I sit down and I write to, I write every day until my tank is empty. You know, I don't count words or pages. I just go, go, go until I have nothing left to say. Every writer does it differently. I was, I was doing a panel yesterday with a bunch of crime writers. We were talking about um, you know, advice and creative writing courses and all that. And, you know, and I, I'm all for that. People can, you know, do that. But it, it, for me, it's like, if you were meant to be a writer, you were going to be a writer um, because you have to be to get through this gauntlet. There are a million exit ramps off the highway for people trying to write a book. And they're very easy to take. And they come up with, uh, this is too hard. I don't have the time. I can't think of this. So they take the exit ramp. They never finish the book. But the ones who really enjoy the process and really like to tell stories, they don't, they pass through all those exit ramps and they keep going. Um, you know, Stephen King once said that oysters don't make uh, pearls by sitting around talking to other oysters. <laughs> you know, so while it's, you know, creative writing classes are great, I never took one. I was a poli sci major in college, so all I did was read and write all the time. Um, yeah. So I like to sort of be in the moment. Um, when I'm writing, and but it's just a compelling for me. If I if I'm not writing, you know, during the course of every day, something is vital is missing from my life. I don't want to I don't want to overstate my outlines too much because they're pretty detailed. But but usually what ends up happening is I end up deviating quite a bit, especially um, especially in the in the ending. Um, like I mean, there there's a lot that that. Uh, happens organically when I when I wrote um, and and yeah I mean you know and a lot of it is just like you especially when you're doing a period piece um, and you just like you find yourself when you're writing it's hard to explain to somebody who, who never tried to write a novel which is obviously such a huge commitment or, or even a short story I guess but like 
you really are in another place, in another time with fictional characters and you're there present, you almost can have memories of, uh, of being there. I still think about, um, there's a scene in the book that takes place at this restaurant, Puccini, where Charlie and Margaret are sitting with the Rat Pack, you know, all of them drinking and talking and like, I can see it in the brain, you know, and, and it's like, a, it's almost like a memory. And when you're there in a place like that, especially if it's a period, um, you know, you can kind of look around and get ideas. Oh, look, there's Hitchcock over there. You know, and like that becomes, oh, I should, maybe I should do more. What's, what's Hitchcock doing at this, you know, and then do some research. What's Hitchcock doing in 1961? Oh, he's filming the birds from 62. That's interesting. So there is some organic quality to it. I, you know, it's funny because I was doing some research um, following up the, the third Archer book. And um, I like making references to uh, real, like as you do, real players. I don't make them vital characters like you do with right. the right back. But I do know, so in, in 1953, um, which is the year the new Archer is set, um, Hitchcock will be directing two films that year. One is Dial M for Murder, which he does in the summer and Rear Window, which he does in November of that year. Um, and it's just fascinating to think about these, you know, incredible films that are classics and, you know, I've watched a million times occurring. You know, one of those films for any director would be like legendary. That would be enough to justify a career. And but filming two of them in the same year just sort of blew me away. And I, I want to ask you this question. I'll give you my example of research that surprised me. Um, so while I was writing the third Archer, um, he has a friend, Liberty Callahan, who he meets in, in the second book. You, you didn't see her in One Good Deed. Um, and she's an actress now in Hollywood. Um, you know, not a star, but she's sort of middle level. She's making decent money. And she buys a bungalow, you know, in LA. And she tells Archer about it. And so I just wrote that, I wrote that line, you know, okay, she, she, bought, a, she bought a house. You know? And I thought, something in the back of my mind, I said, I got to go check that. So I went and checked it, and in 1953, a woman uh, could not get a bank loan um, unless a male co-signed it. I think that was until like the 70s. And, and I had some um, friends of mine who, you know, really prominent businesswomen, who said until the 19, like latter part of the 1980s, they couldn't get a business credit card unless their husbands co-signed for them. And that that those two facts is kind of really. I, the 50s, I sort of get it, although it's still graded on me. Uh, the 80s just kind of blew me away. So what, you, did you come across any research that made you- Well, just... I just realized, have I been calling one good deed one small favor? Because I, I feel like I've been doing that. And, and like, that is it. I will say this, my brain is mush for one hour after my show, just because I'm so intense. So I think I've, I just finished, anyway, I'm sorry. Um, I, you know, I love one good deed. I've been, we've talked about this before. I, I've told you it's like Faulkner. So anyway, I apologize, I apologize for that one good deed. It's one small favor. Is that the is that the Scott Smith book? What is that? That's some other book. Uh, yeah, a simple plan. Simple plan. All right, whatever. There's a there's a good novel uh, title for somebody. One small favor. Anyway, one good deed is what I meant to say. Sorry about that. Um, the thing that I discovered that I was um, really surprised about while doing the research had more to do with the character than it had to do with the, the setting because I kind of knew about um the i mean I, I, 60 i was born in 69 so 62 isn't that far removed from my my life i, I knew a little bit about it. but the fact that sinatra um was so ahead of the curve and progressive on civil rights was such a surprise to me now i knew he i knew he was like a liberal democrat like an fdr democrat before he was a JFK Democrat. And JFK you know, was a more moderate Democrat uh, when he ran for president in 1960 anyway. But um, he, was just, he was just really out there. Like he just did a lot of, I mean, the, the portrait of Sinatra in my book is very complicated and warts and all, and he's a sexist and misogynist. He clearly has mobster friends. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Nothing that people watching us probably didn't already know. But I try to get into some of the, the finer qualities of him in terms of like kindness that he could that he could show. 
And honestly, like he fought to integrate parts of Las Vegas. He really did a lot of good. And that was really surprising to me because this the Sinatra I knew growing up was kind of the bloated, too obvious toupee, caricature, you know, Saturday Night Live doing imitations of him with his capot and others. And not like I, you know, I didn't see the whole rise and everything. The other thing that was really surprising to me was a degree to which he saw himself as kind of like a an underdog even after he was on top of the world and the degree to which his heart was broken by Ava Gardner. And then later, as I try to write about it in my book, um, by JFK, by President Kennedy, who I think he was platonically infatuated with. I, you know, when I read the book, um, you're right. You know, Sinatra had a dark side to him, but he came away, at least for me, as a sympathetic character in this novel. Um, and I found that really intriguing because, you know, I'm older than you, but um, I'm still, you know, young enough to have remember the caricatures and the cartoonish pieces that people did about Sinatra way past his prime. Um, and I didn't know some of the things that you wrote about about him. I certainly knew, you know, he was more liberal, but didn't know that he was sort of you know, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk as well. Yeah, he really was. I mean, in a, to be in favor of civil rights in the 40s and 50s and early 60s may, may seem obvious to us today, but it was not. And in 1960, it wasn't even clear what party was going to embrace civil rights. People might know or not that... You know, civil rights icon Jackie Robinson endorsed Richard Nixon in 1960. Um, it wasn't clear which party was going to take up civil rights. Remember how many of the Democrats in the Senate and the House were Southern Democrats and, and completely objected to civil rights. And I mean, it was the degree to which it, it touched on the book, but it's not a it's not a big part of the book. But um, this is true that, so Sammy Davis Jr. was engaged to a white woman in 1960. Remember this, it only became legal everywhere in the United States for intermarriage, interracial marriage uh, in 1967. I mean like, so this is seven years before that in Loving versus Virginia. And, <clears throat> so, uh, Sammy Davis was going to marry, I think her name was May Britt, and, uh, or Britt May, and um, before the election, and somebody in the Kennedy camp, whether I suspect it was Ambassador Kennedy, but I, I forget right now, but somebody in the camp pushed the Rat Pack, whether it was Peter Lawford or Sinatra or, or Sammy Davis Jr. himself, to delay the marriage until after the election for fear that the interracial marriage would hurt Kennedy because the Rat Pack was behind Kennedy. I mean, that's how crazy. I mean, I know that we, our world is still, there's still too much racism in our world and all that. But that's how blatantly racist the society was. So for Sinatra to be out there, and yeah, he made all sorts of racist jokes on stage with Sammy Davis. They all made fun of each other's ethnicities all the time. But, um, and I'm not excusing it, but he really he really did do a lot. And, that's, and that was surprising to me. I'm glad you thought he was sympathetic. It's funny because a friend of mine who read the book basically expressed the idea that he that one of the tensions in the book was boy jake seems really ambivalent about sinatra where is he going to land on him like is he a good guy is he a bad guy like like what's is he going to end up being the bad guy or the good guy like where is he going to end up and so i i don't i but well, i don't think that was purposeful but that ambivalence um i think probably helped yeah i mean you know, and the Kennedy brothers, for me, in the, in the novel, came away as a lot more transactional, um, a lot more superficial, but tactical. Um, they knew where they what they needed to do to get where they needed to go without really thinking, you know, I'll be less so than, than JFK. JFK was, you know, this is where I need to go and this is what I need to do and, um, and didn't really look sideways about anybody else and what anybody else, you know, mattered to them or not or whether it was going to hurt people or not. It was like, this is where we need to get to. And 
you know, it's, you know, to, the, to this day, that's sort of the politician's playbook. And, you know, when Lyndon Johnson, you know, with the Civil Rights Act, he said it's going to cost the Democrats the South pretty much forever. And um, it seems like that's, you know, breaking down some, hopefully. But uh, yeah. I mean, I read, I, 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 I read a lot about the Kennedys, and I do think that's what they were like. I think Bobby Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, after his brother died, once he became a senator from New York, once he ran for president, became much more legitimately a, a, an icon of, of humanity um, than he was. But like, they were operators in the 50s. And 60s. I mean, Robert Kennedy was on the Democratic staff of the McCarthy committee and, 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 pres and then Senator John F. Kennedy did not equip himself well during the McCarthy era. Um, he was not outspoken against McCarthyism at all. <clears throat> and in fact, the Kennedys um, were friends with McCarthy. And when I was writing the first book, I'd read somewhere that Kathleen Kennedy was, that, that Joe McCarthy was her godfather. And I happened to be doing an event. Uh, I forget exactly what the anniversary was, but there was a whole bunch of different anniversaries where I got to, I had the honor truly of meeting a bunch of the Kennedy kids, uh, Carrie Kennedy, Kathleen Kennedy, uh, Caroline Kennedy and and Kathleen, I asked her backstage of this event. I just you know I happened to be there. Is it true that Jim McCarthy was your godfather? And she said no, but everybody thinks that's true. And but she was very candid. She goes, but we were our families were close. And uh, I, I don't think Jim McCarthy had kids, but, but he was married. And I said, why? And I forget her exact words, but it had something to do with the fact that in the 50s, the Irish were still looked down upon by the wasps that ran American society. And it just seemed, again, it just seems so crazy looking back on it now, because who looks down on Irish people? I mean, like, what a, but I mean, then again, Baldacci, you could probably tell us about things you've experienced as an Italian. Um, but, but, uh, yeah, just it was just so crazy to me. But yeah, I mean, this country's so young, you know. It is. I mean, it absolutely is. I, you know, I joke with people. I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, the old capital of the Confederacy, and I passed by those monuments every day going to college. And I joked that in, in Richmond, if your name wasn't Lee Jackson Stewart or Davis, nobody really cared. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I still remember, you know, in the late 1990s, you know, there were sort of riots in the street and a lot of vitriol because they wanted to add another monument to Monument Avenue. Um, and a lot of people were against it because it was, it was for Arthur Ashe, you know, native Richmonder, icon. He, they wanted to put his monument on there with Lee and Jackson and Stewart, and people just didn't want that. They didn't think it was right for a black man to be on the street with those guys. And I agreed with that. I was like, you need to get those guys off and let's just put Arthur Ashe on there. Right. It'll be one monument avenue. Um, but well, they- Just today on Capitol Hill, uh, they're talking about removing Confederate generals from Statuary Hall. Um, there was a scene in the Hellfire Club where Charlie and uh, a, a black congressman, Isaiah Street, who was fictitious. There was only one black congressman in Congress at the time, Adam Clayton Powell, so mine is, mine is fictitious, but they're sitting there looking at all these uh, statues in Statuary Hall and talking about them. And they're right now talking about getting getting rid of them. And um, Kevin McCarthy, the House Republican leader, said something uh, interesting where he, he was just like, you know, we, we should get we could get rid of them. They're all Democrats. <laughs> Whatever, get rid of them. I don't care. Whatever, whatever justification you need. You you would think that that wouldn't be the one at the top of the list, but uh, <laughs> I guess. For him, but never does the job. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we got about 15 minutes left. Um, let's see if we have some questions, um, and then we can uh, you can answer those. Sure. Hey there. Yeah, we do have some questions for you. Um, let's see here. Um, okay, this one's for Salima, and she writes, knowing that this is for Jake. 
knowing that you like Winston Churchill, have you ever thought of finding a way to have him included in the books uh, besides giving his name to Charlie's dad? Um, I find Churchill fascinating. I mean, I, I, I don't want to be on the record saying that I like Winston Churchill. I, I, I find him fascinating. Uh, I do believe that he saved the world from Nazi tyranny. And for that reason, uh, I admire him. I, I see all the other flaws, many, many flaws. It's an interesting question, Selena, and I have thought about it before. Um, because I think of the universe that my characters are in as a universe where I can do anything. And so while the next novel will be in the 70s and probably star Charlie and Margaret's kids who will be in their early 20s, as opposed to Charlie and Margaret in their 50s, they'll be in the book. But I, I want to give more leading roles to, um, to, to, to younger folk. And, but I do think about, well, what if I did a novel starring Isaiah Street, the, the black congressman, solving a murder or being involved in some horrible thing, horrible situation when he's a Tuskegee Airman? And I have thought about what if I had Winston Martyr, Charlie's dad, who, fought, who fights in World War One? He refers to times he spent fighting in World War One. What if I had Charlie's dad having some sort of experience with Winston Churchill? I have thought about that. Um, so, but but you know, I'll see how many books I got in there. Uh, there's another kind of a related question. Um, Divya, I think, is the name. She says, Jake, I'm interested to know how you came up with the names for Charlie and Margaret Martyr. That's a really good question. Um, so when I was young, like grade school young, camp young, there was a kid named Fee Martyr that, uh, that was on my Little League team. I think he was a camp. And then later there were some, there were these girls in the camp. One of them was named Tammy Martyr. And I just always found the last name Martyr such an interesting name because it's a homonym with Martyr, uh, M-A-R-T-Y-R. And I just always found it fascinating, and it was just never a name that I ever saw in fiction or really anywhere other than Tsvi and Tammy. So I, I like that last name. <clears throat> and I can't tell you why I picked Charlie and Margaret as names other than they seemed like names that kids would be named in the 1920s that wouldn't be like Aloysius Archer. <laughs> To, Al, to, to Aloysius's credit, nobody ever calls him Aloysius uh, in One Good Deed. Uh, but, but in any case, um, yeah, I, and they just seemed like charming names. I actually had a whole thing. You know, the, the Rat Pack used to refer to each other jokingly as Charlie. They would call each other Charlie. And I had a whole thing in there about that. Um... But the uh, but everybody found it too confusing. I didn't write it well enough, or it didn't make sense enough, so I I kept it out. Although I do have a picture, an autographed Frank Sinatra picture to Charlie Frank Sinatra, which I thought about using in the book somehow, but I never did. It's funny how the in the Vietnam era, of course, Charlie became shorthand for the Viet Cong. You know, yeah. Charlie don't or Charlie don't serve, isn't that it from Apocalypse Now? Right. Um, well, just kind of going back to the, the importance of names, we've had some really interesting questions or, or discussions with various authors about just how crucial names are to their work and how if you got a, I'd like to bring in David a little bit, you know, you mentioned Aloysius and of course, Atlee Pine is a wonderful name. Such a good um, name. Such yeah. a good name. Can you talk a little bit, David, about, about, about names and have you ever had the occasion to do a global find and replace with a name? <laughs> <laughs> if I did, I'd block that out of my memory because that showed I, I screwed up so badly the first time around. Um, you know, Atlee Pine, uh, my parents, when they were alive, they lived um, a little bit north of Richmond and going down 95, if you got out at, at the exit to go to their house, if you went to the right, you went to their house. If you went to the left, you went to Atlee, Virginia. And when I was in high school, I played football and I also was a wrestler and we would compete against Adley High School. So that name was firmly in my mind, sort of a Southern name, could be both men and women. 
would be that. And Pine, that was just a name that seemed to fit with Atlee. Um, and with John Puller, he's my military investigator. I grew up in Virginia and every little boy in Virginia, at least when I was in school, was taught about um, Chesty Puller. You know, Chesty Puller was born in Stanton, Virginia. He was the most decorated Marine in US history. He got the three stars, should have gotten the fourth, except he had a falling out with Eisenhower. He volunteered to fight in the Vietnam War, I think when he, he was in his 60s. So when I, I wanted to have a military investigator, sort of ramrod straight kind of guy, uh, Puller was the last name that had really occurred to me sort of naturally. And I fashioned John Puller, his father, John Puller Sr., who was a three star and was denied the fourth star. I sort of patterned him after Chesty Puller because I just, you know, read about him and heard about him so much growing up. Uh, names are hard. You know, my memory man, Am Amos Decker, I wanted a name for him because he's so unusual. I wanted a name that almost nobody ever uses anymore. Amos is a, a name that, you know, obviously in the like 20s and 30s was very derogatory and, and, and Amos and Andy, a, a terribly racist show. Um, but it fit him because it was different and he is totally different. And sometimes names are easy. You know, those three names sort of popped into my head. Aloysius Archer, I was sitting in the middle of a snowstorm in Toronto after doing you know, a book tour for the day. And I saw this wall of white and I, and I sat down and I thought, I'm gonna write a, uh, a crime to war set in the late 1940s. It's gonna be a short story with this guy named Aloysius Archer. I always love the name Aloysius. You never hear it anymore. I'd always love the last name Archer just because I'm a big Ross McDonald fan and Lou Archer was his PI, a great character. Um, and it all just hit. Um, but sometimes, you know, the names don't come as easily. The names are so important. And um, I did do a, I did do a control, whatever you refer to it as, search and replace for a name for one of the for the bad for the for um, the studio head uh, in the book. There's a studio head who keeps appearing, um, Les Wolf, and it's W O L F F two S, and that was um, that was kind of uh, that was kind of last minute. Um, it, it was. Uh, it was less because of Les Moonves. Um, and I thought like Les Moonves was kind of the, who I was thinking of when I wrote the character because he was very charming, very, you know, good looking, impressive, maybe not the best guy in the world. Um, and then I just needed a last name and uh, I went through a bunch of different ones. One of the things that I find frustrating when I, as a reader is when people make names too similar because um, it's fiction, right? You shouldn't have an Alan and an Albert in your book. I'm confused. It's tough. It's tough for people to follow books and, you know, they put them down, they live their life, maybe pick it up a week later. I mean, you got, it can't be too complicated to punch back in. And, um, and I've made that criticism to, to friends of mine before. Like, do not have to, you know, don't, don't do it. So I, I really honestly have tried to make the names as wildly different as possible, um, just so nobody can, gets confused. Because I, I consider myself a relatively intelligent guy, above average. And, uh, you know, if I get confused by names, if they're too similar, I figure that most readers will, or at least some. Um, yeah, did you ever get lost trying to read those Russian novels with those names? Oh my gosh! That's what I'm saying. Exactly. <laughs> or, or or any or any Irish book, any yeah. book, um, except for Joyce. But but generally speaking, like who? I don't what. So Stephen Dedalus and Molly Bloom and um, here's a question from Monica: Who would you have play Charlie and Margaret in the inevitable film adaptation? Well, we're trying to, right now we're trying to, um, I, uh, Mark Smith, who wrote The Revenant, uh, wrote a great teleplay, a pilot. We're trying to make it a show. <clears throat> and uh, David knows this better than I, but Hollywood is just, they move at a glacial pace. Glacial. I mean, I do not even get it. It's amazing anything that's made. Um, but there, it all is on my, <clears throat> on my, on my smart TV. Um, Charlie and Margaret in the Hellfire Club are in their early 30s, and in The Devil May Dance, they're in their 40s. So it depends on which one. Um, Logan, Le Logan Lerman, uh, who I know from a show called Hunters on Amazon Prime, but other people might know through uh, other hipper, younger fare, 
<clears throat> might be a good Charlie, but I'm not really married to it. When, I mean, I think of them in my brain as kind of like at whatever age you want to assign it. Um, like kind of like Jake Gyllenhaal and Jessica Chastain. But truth be told, anybody, I've had one work turned into a, a film. That's the nonfiction book I wrote, uh, The Outpost about Afghanistan. And I think David would agree with me. If you're lucky enough to get your work made into a movie that you're proud of, as long as it's a good actor, that's really all it that matters. Um, I have a question from Joshua, who I think is an aspiring writer. Um, he says, for both uh, Mr. Tapper and Mr. Baldacci, uh, with both The Devil May Dance and A Gambling Man uh, taking place during the Kennedy presidency and post-World War II society, respectively, uh, were there any influential books or research into those eras that helped your writing process? David, do you want to go? Okay. Um, I went back and read a lot of crime and war from that time period. Um, and I obviously did a lot of normal research into, you know, what that life was like and things I needed to know for my characters to do while they were then. And so I didn't want to, you know, mess up on certain critical details because I don't like getting emails <laughs> from people. So, <laughs> hey, screwed up, you're an idiot. And I was like, okay, thank you. Um, I, 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 I get those all the time. <laughs> I mean, for the, for the fiction. I'll, anyway, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, they're always fun. Um, I just wanted to get myself into the, to the mood um, and to see what was important as far as, you know, how I was going to approach this story. I went back and uh, read all of Ross McDonald's, you know, Lou Archer. I read it. went back and read all of Raymond Chandler. Uh, they both wrote, wrote primarily, prim Chandler primarily in the 40s and 50s, uh, McDonald in 40s, 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. Um, and we saw Lou Archer sort of evolve and mature over that time period. It's, I, I was, uh, this panel I did yesterday, we were talking about that, you know, it's, I read for, I read for two reasons. I read for pleasure and I read, I, I like to call it, I read for game film. And when I say that, I read other author, authors to see how they do what they do. Um, and this is the profession where you're always going to be apprenticed for life. You're never going to master this thing. It's a craft. And the only thing you could try to do is get better each time out. And the way you do that is to take advantage of everything you possibly can. One way to do it is don't go out and buy a self-help book, go to the library and check out masters for free who've actually done it and written types of stories that you like to do um, and see you know, what, their, what their process is, what they consider important, how they develop their character. If you break it down on a certain core level, you can learn from things like that. Uh, so that's how I sort of a, approach that. And, then you come up with your own style and your own flavor and how you and your own flair of how you do your own stories. But the core elements, you know, I would recommend people go out and you know read Stephen King's on writing. Go back, go out and read anything Eudora Welty ever wrote or Flannery O'Connor, um, if you want to know how to tell a terrific story. Um, the thing about mystery and, and thrillers, I remember John Updike once said this. I don't know if it's apocryphal. I hope that it's true. Somebody asked Updike one time, you know, two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, how come he had never written a mystery? And his answer was, I'm not smart enough. Yeah, and I think with, you know, not to be too tongue in cheek about it, but with a, with a mystery, you have all the elements of any traditional novel, commercial fiction, literary fiction, then you have the overlay of the puzzle piece on top of it. You know, the, the laying of clues, the red herrings, the misdirections, the twists and turns, and then eventually a solution or resolution to the plot. So those are all things that, you know, you sort of have to keep in mind. You're a writer and you're also a storyteller and you're also having, you're a puzzle maker when you're writing a mystery. And you have to have all those balls in the air and every one has impact on the other. Every decision you make, well, it's, you hit the balloon on this side, something's gonna pop out the other way. Have you found that reading kind of like period uh, newspapers and magazines just to get those little subtle nuanced details, you know, how much a pack of Chesterfield cost in, you know, 1955 or things like that, is that helpful for you? Yeah, if you came to my office while I was while I was writing the Archer book, you would look like you would think you would step back in time. <laughs> All the mag life and look magazines, you know, New York Times and Washington Post from the 40s and 50s, because you really do. I mean, you have to relearn. It's like relearning a new language. Um, everything you write, you know, is going to be checked factually by millions of people once this thing comes out. And uh, people don't hesitate. I, I like to get things as right as I possibly can. I've made errors in my books. And when people point them out, I go back and, you know, I fix them in later editions. You know, I, 
don't want to have something out there. I remember one the, the weirdest one I ever got. Well, not the weirdest, but one I can say on, on to the public is a guy once wrote me, he was an American Airlines pilot. And he said, hey, you know, you had a mistake in this book. And when you had them flying east to west, you had them flying at an uneven altitude. West to east, you had them flying at an odd altitude. And um, it's just the reverse. He could don't feel bad. Stephen King made the same mistake in Long Deliers. Thank you. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I get that all the time. I, I had a, a, a car that existed that didn't exist in 1954. I had it in the Hellfire Club and I went back and made sure that, I mean, it, it's, it's, this isn't the Bible. I mean, we can go back and tweak things, right? So it's not the Ten Commandments. So I fixed that. Um, somebody pointed out um, in uh, that, that uh, uh, I have Charlie, there's a scene that takes place in the Daisy, which is this private club that all these stars went to in the 60s and 70s in Hollywood, Beverly Hills. And I had, I had just, a, you know, I just had all the stars there and I had Charlie Chaplin hitting on, I don't even know, Tuesday Weld or whatever. And, and somebody pointed out to me, you know, Charlie Chaplin uh, was not in the United, like he was, he, he, that was you haven't been in Beverly Hills during the like 40 year period where Charlie Chaplin did not set foot on American soil. I mean, it's novel. Like it's a it's a novel. Like can, can, he snuck in. Can we just say he snuck yeah, in? The but one then, the one Chaplin nerd that would have known that. <laughs> well, it, it didn't matter. I went back and I changed it to Charles Boyer. I, it's just like it's not worth it to me. I you know just it was a throw. It's a sentence, right? But like it just. Okay, you're right. You're right. I mean, other things like other larger things that are that are, you know, I I take issue with the fact that you have you know larger than that they, they can just read another book. But but little tweaks I can make. I'm happy to do. The next book's going to take place in the '70s. I don't know if I need to read like. I mean, I don't. I guess I could go back and read. Like, uh, I don't even know what people were reading in the seventies. What was? What were the? Like, I feel like it was a lot of. I don't know, I have to go back. Herman Woke, James Clavell. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jackie historical Jackie. fiction for sure. I have a question for both of you, which is, what's happened to the role of the copy editor? I thought there was supposed to be a backup team at your publisher that was supposed to be checking this stuff so that you didn't look so embarrassed. Is that, uh, is that a long gone um, position? There's still copy editors there, but at the end of the day, you know, I, um, the buck stops with us. Yeah. Yes. Nobody I'm, not, I'm not embarrassed by it. I mean, it's, a, it's not a big deal. It's fiction. You know what, Charlie Chaplin snuck back into the country. That, you right. Know, I, <laughs> right. A stealth mission by Charlie Chaplin. Actually, that's <laughs> a really great idea. You really a, on Tuesday well, you know, she was very pretty. <laughs> I, I think that they're, the copy editors do a great job, but they're, they're, they're focused on, uh, I mean, where the real issue is, is for nonfiction. And, and, and this is a separate issue. These are novels, like, you know, people need to just like let it go. <clears throat> um, or, or we need to make the corrections depending on how we feel. But the real issue is that that is more important than than this is the degree to which there aren't fact checkers at for nonfiction books. Um, I just don't think that exists anymore, if it ever did. Um, so I know a lot of people who write nonfiction who hire their own fact checker. Wow. Well, what do you think, Barbara? Maybe as a final question. Um, Colleen asks, uh, what, do, what are you both currently reading? I'm, I always, I'm always in the middle of like five things. Um, right now, uh, I'm reading, a friend of mine uh, asked me to blurb his book, so I'm reading his book. It's, a, it's about, it's, a, it's a, a, a kind of a lighthearted uh, explanation of philosophy. Um, and let me look at my Kindle, which is right on my uh, phone here. So I'm reading that. I'm reading, I just finished One Good Deed like a week or two ago. Uh, the air conditioning sounds kind of like an oxygen tank. 
And Mike Nichols. I'm reading uh, Mike Nichols by Mark Harris. The, so that's nonfiction. What about you, David? I'm, um, I'm reading a book I think it was a Reese Witherspoon pick a few months ago. Um, I'm doing a book that I'm, I've been asked to, to write a blurb on set in outer space, which I've never really um, read much about that. And um, so I'm looking forward to doing that. I'm reading a, uh, another Ross McDonald that I had not read before. I think it's called The Gin Something. It's sort of mid, mid-career for Lou Archer. Um, um, I've done a lot of blurbs this year for people and um, books I really liked. I, I like doing a mix of established writers and also uh, young writers coming up. Um, I just finished The Maidens, which is Alex Mechalidis' latest novel. He wrote The Silent Patient uh, and gave that a good blurb because it was a really great book. Um, so yeah, you know, it's summer now. I've got my big stack. I'm sure just like everybody else and I'll work my way through it. I'm going to make a recommendation that has nothing to do with either one of you, but I am so enchanted by this book. And also because Jake is, as he just told us before we started, a failed cartoonist. Um, and so it kind of comes into play. It's called Subpar Parks, but it really should be called Snark at the Park because this book is about people who um, have made comments about how disappointed they are when visiting our national parks. And this woman, I, this is my very favorite. The comment is, this is the arches in Utah. And the snark comment is, it looks nothing like the license plate. And, and so the, the author who's done this cartooning sort of thing, Jake, for all of the national parks um, refutes the criticism that the visitors have put in. I love the one about Bryce Canyon, which says it's too orange, or uh, Carl's Bad Caverns, badly lit. <laughs> and you know, I, I thought it said a lot about what we were talking about earlier, what you were talking about earlier about the younger generation and how they view the world and how they communicate. Um, and you know, social media allows them to make these snarky comments. And actually, nobody really cares if you thought Carl's Bad Cavern was badly lit. You know, it's still I mean, a great book. But I love the way this book, it's a Random House book. Actually, it's Plume, um, part of Penguin Random House. But it came my way, and I've just been enchanted with it. But I thought about you, Jake, because really there's an opportunity for amazing cartooning um, as a part of this. So if you run, if you run dry in fiction, Here's your chance to pull snarky stuff off the internet and uh, and create a book. I will say at one point, not soon. At one point, I do want to do a graphic novel, but I feel like that's as as rough as writing a novel is. That's like a hundred times rougher. It was hard. Is, is there anything that you can tell us? A little taste of what the the third book might be about. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's the main character will be uh, Charlie and Margaret's son, uh, Dwight, I, otherwise known as Ike, Ike Martyr. And Ike Martyr is a um, is a U.S. Marine who just got back from the Middle East, and he's in Jimmy Carter's Washington in 1977. And uh, his sister Lucy works at the Republican National Committee. And they're convinced they're never going to win another election because of Richard Nixon. And uh, they're just despondent and trying to figure out what to do. But that's about all the time. David, what's Mercy going to be about? You've mentioned it was sadly fine, but can you tell us any more? Yeah, and this one, she's been, you know, in three books, she's been looking for her twin sister. Um, they were, her twin sister was kidnapped when they were six years old, and she's been searching for her ever since. She's an FBI agent now. So this this will, the fourth book will be the resolution of that of that piece. Um, she finds out what happens to Mercy and also with, to her parents. Um, that's why the book is entitled Mercy. The first book was called Long Road to Mercy. I told my fans, I'm not kidding. It is a long road to Mercy. <laughs> it's going to be several books before this is resolved. So now it finally is. And I think people will be happy um, that it is resolved. So when you get to the end of a story arc like that, are you going to retire that character? Because you do like to start up things and, and pursue them for a while. Yeah, I, I think Atlee has more books in her. You know, my list to test is when I finish a novel with the character is, do they have more, more they have to tell me about themselves? And if they do, then I'll crank up another book. If they don't, Wonderful. then... Well, we'll look for it in November. Thank you very much, gentlemen. This encore event was really fun. Maybe we should sort of make a habit of 
<laughs> screwing up. So we won't have to do it again because the infrastructure is going to be improved significantly. <laughs> Good point. We put in a generator and right before we started this, it kicks on every Tuesday afternoon to test itself. And it feels as though I'm living in, you know, an airplane test tunnel or something because it's right outside my office. But it's a feeling of safety. So you might want to think about it. They're, they're really an excellent idea. Patrick, thank you very much. Um, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day and their evening. Goodbye, guys. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks, David. Thanks, Patrick.